Hey, welcome back to another video about the parasites that the horse encounters in its life. My name is Martin Nielsen and I am a horse parasitologist here at the University of Kentucky in the United States and this is my lab. Today I'm really really excited about this fifth episode of our video series. We're going to completely shift gears today. We're going to talk about a very, very different parasite from all of the other parasites we've talked about so far. Now we're going to the flatworms. So all of the previous worms we talked about were all roundworms. They were all nematodes. So typical wormy appearance. Now with the flatworms, yeah, you can imagine it's because they're flat. So they do have a different appearance, but they also have some different biologies. Uh, and we're gonna get to that today. So tapeworms in horses, that's today's topic. So there are three kinds of tapeworms that horses can get. Uh, one of them is the common one and, and the two others are really, really rare. So the three species, you can see the Latin names up here on the screen. Uh, the common one, the one that your horse is likely to encounter in its life is Anoplocephala perfoliata. Uh, the two other species are very, very rare. Um, I've actually only met one of them in real life and the other one I've only met as a, as a museum specimen. So that's how rare uh, they are. Nonetheless, they can occur as well, so you have to keep them uh, in the back of your mind. So tapeworms is uh, something that any warm-blooded animal can get. Uh, however, they are species-specific, so the ones infecting horses can only infect horses, etc. Um, a couple things in terms of differences between your typical classic tapeworm that uh, you may have heard about, the one that can grow to be meters long and, and live in the entire length of the small intestine, uh, and, then, and then these in the horse. Uh, they tend to be uh, very short actually in the horse. So if we look at our common uh, tapeworm in horses, Anoplocephala perfoliata, um, we can look at some stages here. You see these little flakes that are floating around? These are all immature stages of uh, the worm and each of them represent one worm. Uh, and so we're not talking about one very long slender organism, we're talking about multiple short ones. Uh, some would say that, that these are maybe the size of a small gummy bear, kind of in that uh, size range. And then they grow a little bit larger over time. And so we're looking at the same species here, but these are adult mature worms. And so this is as large as they get. So you can say that we're now a little bit larger than gummy bear. Uh, I usually say they look like the, the Swedish fish gummies, uh, just a different color and shape, but that's about where we are. So. Typically, a horse, when it gets tapeworms, it will have more than just one. Uh, it will have a, a cluster, a few, and, and this all came from one horse uh, that was completely healthy, by the way. And so that's not unusual at all. Now, um, I also have a 3D um, uh, preparation here that allows us to take a better and a little bit closer look here. Um, it's kind of neat. You can better sort of see what these look like in a 3D um, preparation. Now the fluid that they're in here, please don't, come on, don't tell anyone, this is hand sanitizer. Actually um, the point with the hand sanitizer is that it contains alcohol as you know and we actually use alcohol to preserve these specimens so we can work with our DNA etc. Uh, so, so that's actually uh, something that we use here in, in our research. Uh, we can take a look at, at some of these, may, maybe a little bit more up close. You see here uh, some of those 3D mounted worms there and you can sort of appreciate how, how they look like. Now, I mentioned the two other species. Uh, one of them is called Anoplocephala magna. So magna means big and so you can see here um, that one has more of a long slender sort of wormy appearance here and it's more actually shaped like a tape which is how uh, tapeworms got their common name is that because they had this sh tape sort of uh, shape and you can see here it's a, it's folded along its 
its long axis. Uh, so, so that's your Anoplocephala magna, the one I have never met in real life, and I've only met it as a museum specimen. So it's it's rare. Um, and actually, in inside of this jar, there's um, several of these long uh, Anoplocephala magna worms. So, so they can occur as well. However, they are uh, really rare. So. That's a little bit about how they look like. So now let's get to the most exciting part of my videos. And you know what's coming next. Yes, we're going to talk about the life cycle. And you know what I'm going to say next. Yes, this life cycle is really unique and fascinating. And it really truly is. So let's pull that slide up. Can we get that slide up, please? There we go. Thank you. So. A couple things that stand out uh, for this life cycle that's entirely different from uh, the other two. The first one is that these worms are both male and female at the same time. Now, uh, that's pretty neat because, uh, you know, it makes dating a whole lot easier. There's no need for Tinder or any other online dating app there. They already met, so that's pretty smart. Uh, we call that... Uh, hermaphrodite uh, so when an organism is both male and female and it can self fertilize so they don't even need to find a mate They're, they've already made it so so that's unique and that's certainly very different from all the other worms we talked about now the other thing, thing that's different and you can see this on the slide is the intermediate host none of the other worms I've talked about so far had more than just the horse as its host these ones, tapeworms in general, they need an intermediate host to pick them up in the environment somehow, and then they develop inside that intermediate host before the final host then eats the intermediate host and gets infected. So most of the time that works by a carnivore eating some kind of prey that has the intermediate stage of the parasite, and then they get it that way. Now, horses are not carnivores. They do not eat meat. Uh, so... Um, there's a slightly different strategy there that the parasites has taken, and that's using uh, a sweet little innocent dung mite. Um, we call it the orbited mite that lives in the environment. It lives in the soil. It crawls around the glass, on the grass blades, and it will be in the fecal pile as well. That little thing just by accident picks up the egg, the egg uh, of the worm here, and then it infects the uh, mite, and then. Uh, the horse will eat some of the mites when they're grazing just because they're everywhere and that's how the horse gets infected so uh, it is useful it is useful to know a little bit about the mites and what sort of conditions they like and so as a general rule of thumb is that whenever you have this green stuff that's where you will have the mites so it's actually as simple as that they like a moist and lush environment which is the kind of environment that makes the grass grow and and when you have a little bit of length to the grass there'll be some moisture retained in between the, the uh, grass blades and that's where the mites like to crawl around this is important because most of us keep horses on conditions that like to look like that especially sometimes a year so that also means that maybe this parasite is pretty common um, i'm going to get to that in just a little bit the other point is that there will be environments that are pretty hostile to those mites so very dry areas uh, people who live in the desert or on the on the border of the desert with the horses well there will not be much of that green stuff around and if you don't have that you have to supplement feed uh, supplement with hay or otherwise well there really aren't much uh, good conditions for tapeworm transmission and actually not for um, the strong parasites either and so so there are some differences there. Now, um, if we uh, look at how common this parasite is, so I sort of already said it, if there's grass, there's gonna be tapeworms. And, and that I think is the rule of thumb. So you should not be surprised if you horses are uh, kept with access to grass, to grazing, that some of them might have tapeworms. That's the expected finding. We find, however, the prevalence, so that's how many horses out of the total number of horses on the farm that have the worm, that number varies quite a bit. So it's unlike the strong jaws where I said that all horses get strong jaws. You remember the breaking news? 
uh, here with the tapeworms, just because one horse has it on the farm does not necessarily mean that the next horse has it and the next horse next to that one. Uh, that prevalence can can fluctuate from a low number, say about 10%, sometimes even lower, up to 90 or 100%, so it can, it can vary on the whole scale. On average, however, I want to say roughly 50% of horses uh, would be expected to have the tapeworm. The other thing that's important to know about this worm here is that it doesn't stimulate immunity. Uh, it's like this parasite has said, you know what? Um, I don't think that all that fancy immune system talk really applies to me, so I'm just going to keep going. Um, old horses can have just, or older horses, mature horses can have just as many tapeworms as a young horse can have. Sometimes the older horses even have more. We don't see a decline in numbers uh, with age. I, neither numbers of worms per horse or numbers of horses infected. That number stays fairly constant. The most important factor that seems to be affecting whether those horses have tapeworms or not is how much they're turned out on grass. We like to turn our horses out on grass, so it is an expected finding to, to find them with tapeworms. And the other thing that I think is important to know is that there is a seasonality to when and how horses acquire these tapeworms. So they acquire them over the course of the grazing season, just like with a whole lot of the other worms. So you'll see more worms in the intestinal tract by the end of the grazing season. So in the fall, in the autumn, and through winter, if you don't deworm for tapeworms, these horses will carry uh, these worms with them. And then come springtime, the worms will be ready. They'll be at this um, adult stage, mature stage, where they are releasing their eggs. Um, so, so that's that's the cycle, uh, and then they will die, and they'll get replaced over summer by uh, the next season's worms. So I talked about the releasing of eggs, and so how do you how do you diagnose this parasite? That's that's quite important. Now with small animals, with dogs, some of you may have heard about these these segments, tapeworm proglottids, as we call them, that come out with a feces and a little rice grain uh, appearance thingies that sometimes even are moving around. Um, that is not what happens in horses. If we look at a tapeworm segment, a proglottid, uh, from Anaplocephala foliata, it looks like this, and it's this is less than 10 millimeters wide, and it is ultra, ultra thin, and it is mixed in with the feces, and it disintegrates before it comes out with the feces. So you will not see these in the um, in the feces of your horse. However, one of the other two species um, uh, of tapeworms, the ones that's so rare uh, that I've only met them twice in my career, uh, it's a Amplocephaloides mammalana. Sometimes they release intact tapeworm segments and um, it can look like a picture like this that I got from a veterinarian who sent me this picture. You see these little white spots. Those are the segments, and they are going to be even smaller than um, than for the common tapeworm. But those can come out intact, and they can actually be uh, moving around actively, just like you see in dogs. So, uh, if you see these, I would suggest you collect them, uh, put them in a bag, and show them to your veterinarian. And they would either they would know, or they would be able to look up in a book and find out which worm that is. Um, it's unlikely to be the common tapeworm, though. And so. And then when we talk about uh, how to diagnose, so they release these eggs. In that, uh, each of these segments are like an egg packet, a bag that's full of eggs. And so they tend to be released in clumps. And that means that it can be hard to sometimes detect them with your regular egg counting method. But there are uh, modified egg counting techniques that are specially um, optimized for tapeworm detection. And they're actually very reliable, uh, especially for detecting worm burdens that are above 20 worms uh, for horses, which is where we start seeing uh, the risk of disease. So, so these tapeworm eggs here, uh, that is an option, but you need a specialized uh, modified egg counting technique in order to do so. Um, then there are a whole slew of other techniques available too, depending on which country you're in, but you can measure antibodies to tapeworms. Uh, either with a blood sample, and, and there are tests available in the U.S. as well as in Europe. 
Um, but you can also do it most recently uh, with a saliva test where the owner collects the saliva uh, sample and then submits it to the lab. And that's currently available in Europe. Um, both of these tests measure antibodies to the tapeworm. So it te tells us a lot about what the infection pressure is, how much have these horses been exposed to tapeworms. And that is extremely useful because we can use that to tweak our protocol, our deworming protocol, and sort of decide how often and how much we need to deworm specifically for tapeworms. And, and so, um, so those tests are certainly valuable and can help us uh, shape our parasite control program. The saliva test has also been used as selective deworming. Uh, so there is a cutoff value uh, and above which the lab is recommending treatment. So that's another approach one can take with those tests. So how about disease? Uh, since we're talk about, talking about all of these tests and all of that, um, what, what do these parasites actually do? So let's take a good close look at this ugly looking critter up close. Oh, oh. <clears throat> that wasn't very pleasant. Can we get the real picture up, please? <sighs> Thank you. Ah, oh, that's so much better, isn't it? So we're looking at a cluster of these, and they are gathered at the site in the intestinal tract where they really like to hang out. And they have a very specific uh, place that they want to be, and you don't actually find them uh, anywhere else. And this is right at the junction between the small intestine, where the small intestine meets the large intestine. So we have the ileum and the cecum, and right at that junction, that's where they uh, hang out. And when I say hang out, I mean literally, because they latch onto the mucosal wall of the intestine. So each worm sucks onto the wall, and it actually leaves a little bit of a, a sore, a, an ulcer with some reaction, some inflammation around it. And you know, by mere numbers, the more worms you have, the more of that you get. And that causes uh, irritation, inflammation in the intestinal tract. And you can have these, these reactions that will lead to colic. Now, there's also just the mechanical uh, disruption that these worms can cause because um, the small intestine ends right there and sometimes you have so many worms that they also sit there in that lower part of the small intestine which we uh, call the ileum and when they do that they can block the intestine just mechanically it's a clog just like we talked about with the ascarids and the foals they do these do the exact same thing and the space is narrow it's pretty rigid right there and if they if they can sit right there you can have this impaction and you may remember if we have impaction in the small intestine, it is a serious condition. It is much more serious than an impaction in the large intestine. And simply be just because it's the small intestine is so much more narrow. And so that can be a surgical condition that, that where the horse will need to, to be taken to the hospital and operated. The other thing that can happen, uh, which has been scientifically shown to be associated with tapeworms, is the telescoping. And when I say telescoping, it's essentially that the small intestine pumps uh, and works really hard to get past these, these worms. And maybe it reacts even more because there's irritation in the mucosal wall because of the worms attaching there. And sometimes it pumps so much that it can pump right inside and turn inside out and go inside the uh, cecum in the, in the large intestine. So it's sort of turning itself inside out by telescoping in there and that can be painful um, sometimes the horses can just telescope right back and no one ever noticed but if they just sit there for a little bit too long in that telescoped sort of um, state then you can get the swelling and once it's swollen then it's very very difficult to retract and yet, then yet again we have a surgical condition that's actually caused or associated uh, with the tapeworms so there's no doubt that tapeworms can cause specific types of colic those colleagues are associated uh, to very, very specific regions in the intestinal tract um, and right there at that junction. And however, that does not mean that every time a horse gets tapeworm, it will also get colic. Uh, or it would not mean that any time a horse colics that it's probably tapeworms. It's not how it works. Um, in the large majority of cases, horses harbor these worms with no issues at all. Yet again, my research animals, the horses that I keep in that herd that have not been dewormed for 41 years, 
they uh, have a lot of tapeworms and we don't see these types of colic there and we haven't for 40 years and so nonetheless there is reason to deworm our horses and that is to minimize that risk and so that's why that's what we're here for that's why we're making these recommendations and that leads us right to the last section which is treatment what can we deworm these horses with to get the tapeworms now i have some good news for you uh, there is no drug resistance in, reported in these so that's great so what we have should work However, I ought to say that some of that is probably because we don't have the best diagnostic tests for detecting drug resistance, and that's a whole lengthy discussion that we can take another time why that is. But the diagnostic tests I mentioned earlier, neither of those are really, really useful for uh, resistance detection. And so maybe that's part of it. But I am pretty certain that veterinarians would notice if, the, if their treatments would not work, and um, that has not happened yet. So we have two dewormers that work. One is the Pyrantel uh, type dewormer, so that's uh, the Pyrantel paste, empanate, or um, pamoate, and uh, that's the same that we use for the, for the roundworms and for the ascarids. Um, but it is given at a double dose, so it's double the dose as we use for the other worms, and that has a good efficacy against tapeworms. The other option is Prosequantil, and you see that there. That's available in a number of different dewormers, and it's usually, actually nowadays, I think always, combined with another dewormer. So you'll have two different actives in that product, and typically the other active is either ivermectin or moxidectin. So if you look for these product names that end on plus or gold or max or something like that, that all indicates that the prosequantil has been added for tapeworm effect or tapeworm efficacy. And it's there to, to, to provide a more uh, broad spectrum uh, drug. So when we talk about the uh, sort of seasonality of the worm, most often in most climates and most locations, the good time of year to think about deworming for tapeworms is in the autumn at the end of that grazing season. And that's because the worms are accumulated over summer. So there will be more worms in the autumn than you'll have in the spring, for example, inside the horses. And then the other reason is that those types of disease that I just talked about, those types of colic that are associated with the tapeworms, those usually happen over winter, um, in the winter months. And so we don't want horses to carry a large burden of these with them um, into the winter. Uh, the worms want to hang out there. Well, we, we cannot blame them for that. That's a nice place for them to be. Uh, and they want to hang out there until the next spring. But uh, we sometimes see the colleagues right there when the horses are in the winter season. And so that's why we want to deworm in the autumn. So autumn is a good time for tapeworm uh, testing also if you have some of those tests available. So talk to your veterinarian about that, but that would be the starting point. And then if you have evidence that you have a higher tapeworm infection pressure, that could be reasons for adding in another tapeworm treatment, but that's something you need to talk to your veterinarian about. And so that brings us to the end of this video. So what have we learned about the equine tapeworms? Um, so the equine tapeworm is the worm that's found a very smart way of dating. Uh, so, you know, all present there at the same time. And it's also one that doesn't really believe in that fancy immune system and, and just seems to ignore that. So with that, I hope to see you again in the next video uh, next week. And until then, hang tight and see you then.